Hi, everyone. Welcome to Using Music to Facilitate Language, Communication, and Social Skills for All at this year's 2024 ABLE Assembly. My name is Brian Wagner Young, and I am the New York State School, Mu School Music Association, or NISMA, Neurodiversity and Accessibility Chair. On top of that, I am an educator for New York City Public Schools, where I mostly teach elementary and middle school general music. Mostly I teach in a center-based special education program, but I do have experience working in inclusion and in gifted and talented settings. I also have experience teaching elementary, middle school, and high school adaptive string orchestra and elementary and middle school musical theater. On top of that, I am also an adjunct instructor at CUNY Brooklyn College, and I am also a music education consultant. Our focus for today is talking about language and communication and how we're enhancing language acquisition and development for all. And while I will be talking about different strategies that are designed for our students who have the most needs, in reality, all students will benefit from this. The strategies that are designed for some benefit all at the same time. So our schedule for today is after this brief introduction, we're gonna add some context and talk about what is language. After that, we're gonna go over some basic concepts that might be new to you, or they might be familiar to you. And then lastly, I'm gonna share a couple examples of what does this look like from my own classroom, music and language for all. So first, what is language? Let's add some context. All teachers, including music teachers, we are all teachers of language. Language and communication are infused into every aspect of what we're doing. Whether we're teaching, whether we're using repertoire, whether we're having our students engage with the, each other, language and communication go hand in hand and are infused in everything that we do. Language refers to the words we use and how we use them to share ideas and get what we want, while communication refers to the active process of exchanging information and ideas, communication involves both understanding and expression. While we think about language and communication, language does not have to be only words that are spoken. There are so many other ways that we can communicate and use language with each other and with the environment around us. For example, maybe we're using visuals or pictures. Maybe we're using gestures or sign language. Maybe we're using facial expressions or tone of voice or inflection. Maybe we're incorporating technology such as iPads or GoTalks. Maybe we're pointing or looking. There are so many other ways that we can get our student and each other to use language and communication. However, without any access with a way to communicate, our students have no way to interact with the surrounding world or with each other. When we also think about language, there's really two types of language. Receptive language is kind of similar to input. It's when students are able to understand or process information that is coming towards them. On the opposite side, there's expressive language, which is similar to output. So this is when students are able to use symbols of language to express their thoughts. Some students might have challenges in only receptive or only expressive, while some students might have challenges in both. In addition to that, we also may have students who are non-speakers. We don't use the term non-verbal anymore, but students who are non-speakers still have multiple different ways that they are able to communicate in our classrooms and within our environments. And we also may have some students who may be emergent at vocalizing sounds and words. And music is a great way to reinforce this skill. In addition to language and communication, we also need to consider social skills. How are our students communicating, interacting with each other, with us, and with their environment? We often assume that our students already have a preset knowledge of how to engage with the world around them, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're imitating what they see in their world. Sometimes they're imitating by what they see from their peers or us, or even at home or on TV. We need to give our, stand, our students a chance to be taught, practice, and have time to apply these new skills. And we need to be aware that some students prefer engaging with multiple peers 
while some also prefer the solitude of working alone. And lastly, music is a language and can allow possibilities for our students to communicate where sometimes words cannot. We can use music to become the language of our students and give them that way that they can interact with the world around them. So what are the basic ideas? One is the idea of whole language activities. Whole language activities comprises listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And all four of these are found in our music room. For example, listening can be connected to hearing, touching, looking, or feeling. Speaking can be connected to singing, talking, discussing, using gestures, moving, pointing, or touching. Reading can be connected to notation, icons, colors, images, pictures, shapes, and objects. And writing can be connected to composing, notes, objects, pictures, technology, and improvisation. Whole language activities are found in all aspects of what we are doing in our music classroom, and we should be incorporating all four of these on a regular basis. A second idea is what we call universal design for learning. And I'm sure UDL, you're gonna be hearing a lot of this at this year's ABLE Assembly. While well, universal design for learning is a framework that involves multiple means of representation, action and expression and engagement, in my own words, universal design for learning are the strategies that we design for our students who have the most needs, but they benefit everyone at the same point. So while the strategies you're gonna see later that are designed for our students who are emergent at that language or communication, every one of our students is gonna benefit from having this in their teaching and in their learning. Another area is what we call assistive technology. Assistive technology is simply any type of technology that we can incorporate that gives our students more access. Assistive technology goes from low tech, which is simply pencil grips, as you see on the screen, all the way to high tech, which could be technology such as iPads to communicate. The more technology that we incorporate into our classroom that connects to language and communication, the more access that our students have to finding ways to communicate and use language with each other. Another area is what we call task analysis. Task analysis is simply how do we break things down into smaller steps or chunks that add up into something larger. And for me, task analysis is all about just simply break it down, build from piece by piece into something larger. And for some of our students, this is how they make logical sense of the world. So breaking things down into smaller steps. And lastly, how are we making our classrooms multi-sensory? How do we have visual aspects? How do we have auditory aspects, kinesthetic aspects, and tactile aspects? So for example, when we're teaching and we're planning our lessons, do we, can our students see it? Can they hear it? Can they move to it? Can they touch it? But on the flip side, not only is it about how I'm presenting the content, I'm also giving them a multi-sensory way that they can respond. Do they have a visual way that they can show it? Can they have an auditory way that they can show it? A kinesthetic way that they could show it back or a tactile way? Multi-sensory learning simply translates back to multiple different ways and connects back to universal design for learning. So let's look at some examples of what this looks like. There are multiple different ways that we can incorporate language and communication in our classrooms. I'm just gonna go through a couple of them and the examples of what they look like in my own classroom, but some that I just wanna highlight is multiple ways to communicate. As mentioned, not everyone has to speak. Maybe they're pointing to you to tell you something. Maybe they're showing you to tell you something. Always having multiple different ways that our students can have access. Using scripts, which you're gonna see an example of in a second. Scripts are one of my favorite ways of incorporating language and communication and getting my students to take ownership, be empowered and develop independence and allowing opportunities for peer modeling opportunities. 
I know, for example, that when I'm teaching a lesson, my students are always watching. So I'm making sure that I'm always imitating exactly how that I would want them to respond. And almost in my head, I follow my own script so that each time that I teach a lesson, it's literally in the exact same way. So at some point, students can feel empowered and take over and repeat the lesson. So as mentioned, one area is what we call scripts. Scripts are exactly what they sound like. When you think of a script, you're probably thinking of reading a script from a movie or a play. A script is simply dialogue that tells us what to say. So for example, this is three steps from the vocal warm-up that I have in my classroom that we do on a daily basis. There are three steps. First, how long is your voice? So we just hold a sustained ah. After that, can it go high and low? So ah. And then third, can you sing the notes? So we just sing a scale using solfege. And we also use current hand signs because I'm also receptive that not all of my students are using their voices to show. Now, granted, this is task analysis already, breaking things down into small three-step chunks. But I want my students to feel empowered and have the opportunity to lead the vocal warm-up by themselves. So I can take this activity and just modify it and make it look like this. In this example, it's the exact same activity, except now we're using a script so students can feel empowered and lead it. So for example, going back to the first one, how long is your voice? My turn to show you. Ah, uh, then I can call on someone in the class. So either I can use their name, I can use a gesture to refer to them. Maybe I even have pictures of the students and they're using a Velcro card to point or show whose turn it is next. And then after that, I can also give feedback. I can say, great job, because you did a great job showing us how long your voice was or you held it really long. Next time, try breathing before it or something like that. But you're giving your students the opportunity to engage with each other, take leadership. You're also developing critical thinking at the same time because they have to come up with their own ideas to give feedback. And gradually, you could do this with an entire activity just by making it into a script. This is another example of a script. So I do this in my orchestra program where I have student conductors come up and lead a piece of music. First, we have a small schedule that we follow. Either the student does it or even if I'm teaching, this is the exact sequence or task analysis that we follow. First, we analyze the music. Then we play the song, give feedback ask for soloists, give feedback again, and then play the song again. And when I say song, literally a song is an eight measure from a method book, it's a 30 second song. But this is the sequence that we follow. When we talk about analyze the music, analyze is a big D-O-K word. In my classroom, analyze means look and talk. And for that, we add a script again. So the conductor can ask, what do you see? They can ask someone in the class, then that person can respond, I see, maybe they see a quarter note, maybe they see the pitch F sharp. And then I can either agree or disagree, and I have to answer with because. Again, you're adding critical thinking. So we're having a script to lead an ongoing conversation. Same thing for feedback. I'm very big on giving immediate feedback in my classroom because I think it makes more immediate sense. So when we're giving feedback, the student conductor can say, I like it because, and then next time try. And if necessary, you can provide prompts. So for example, I liked it because you played all the notes, but next time try keeping a steady beat. So you're giving your students the opportunity to use language and communication and interact with each other. This is just another example of a script. In part of my classroom with my middle school students is an activity called Time to Move, where we're learning the dance that we're doing for whatever show that we're preparing for. And part of that is we use color-coded uh, dancing spots that we put on the floor, but everything is about student choice. So it, even just choosing what color spot you want is all about student choice. So somebody would go around with a visual or a script that says, what color do you want? And then somebody can respond with, I want, and then I have another visual that has six different color options, red, yellow, orange, green, blue, purple, colors of the rainbow. They can either tell us with their voice or they can point to show us. 
So multiple different ways, again, to communicate, even just getting or handing out materials becomes interactive and we're using language and communication. The only difference between the left side and the right side that you'll notice is it's the same script, but the right side is just a little bit more advanced. What color do you want? I want purple. Then they could say, here you go, and then that person can respond, thank you. So in this example, it's an ongoing conversation because for some of our students, this doesn't come natural. Give them the opportunity through our basic routines that happen on a daily basis. Part of my classroom also is students monitor their own behavior. Well, at least they do for me with my older students in middle school. So in my classroom, I have something that's called rock star etiquette. After each activity, and I primarily have three large activities in each class, students have the opportunity to earn a point as they're going through the sequence. And for each activity and each time we do this, I'll have a rock star helper who goes around with the rock star chart asking them, are you being a rock star? Then the person can respond yes or no. They can either tell us with their voice, they can show us with their hands, or they can point to tell us. Then they turn the chart over and it says why, and now they have to tell us why, and then they earn their point. So again, it's all about interaction. They're interacting with each other, empowerment, independence, but also ownership, and they're engaging with each other. In addition to scripts, I'm all about providing visuals and prompts in every aspect of my classroom. At this point, I probably can proudly say I have a visual for everything that I have in my classroom. And if I don't, I wind up still creating one because they are necessary for many of my students. So in this example, these are just pictures of instruments. Now, I would not have just presented like this in front of my students. If I had a picture of a hand drum, it would be on the bucket where the hand drums are. It would be in my music literacy. It might be on my smart board telling us what materials that we need. It might be I might hold up a picture to tell them or prompt them what they need. But I use these visuals so my students have multiple different ways to communicate what they need. In addition to instruments, I also have pictures for classroom materials. I also have visuals for steps that we're doing if we're learning a dance. So if we're clapping our hands, you're going to see a picture of clap your hands. If we're doing a dab, I have a picture of dab. Everything is color coded, even my music literacy, but everything is visual. So you have multiple different ways to communicate what you see, what you need, or what you want. So for example, let's say, let's pretend that we're doing a dance right now. And I ask my students, what moves do you see on the screen? You have multiple different ways that you can tell me. You can use your voice to say, I see three steps on a clap. You can point to show me. So this is where they're pointing to the visuals or you can show me itself. So you can either do it in your seat or you can stand up to show me that you understand the moves. That's another way that we're able to communicate, multiple different ways, but all through the sense of using visuals. In, a different, in addition to visuals, I have visual support all around my classroom. I am known for not having posters up. I do not have decorations up. Every bulletin board or every uh, open space in my classroom is used as some sort of support that can help my students. So for example, this is a board that I call music chat. And because my students don't always say the most appropriate things or always aren't on task or in context of what we're doing, the supports are there so they can regularly connect to it. So if I need to ask a question, here are just some basic things I can ask. If I need to have a response, these are basic things that I can respond. And it's completely visible from where they're sitting. So they always have a reference to it. It may be hard to see it in the picture, but you'll notice that the green side is green and the red side is red. That is because everything that I do is connected to go and stop, which is called conceptual learning, connecting back to things that are part of our day to day and familiar lives and connecting it to something else. So green and red are infused into every aspect of my classroom. And in this example, things you can ask are green or things you can respond with are red. And the last strategy I just want to show you is music itself. How are we using music to infuse language? 
So one example is I call it fill in the blanks or creating your own ideas, which will help you facilitate your own language into the context of a song. So this is a song, Green Eggs and Ham from Susical the Musical. The left side are the actual lyrics to the song, but on the right side, you'll notice that there are a lot of lines because here each student, if we were working on this song, would be choosing their own idea of what would you not eat green eggs and ham with? And then when it came time to perform the song, again, you would have multiple ways that you can show us your idea. You can either sing it or speak it. You could draw a picture of it. You can use gestures to show it or act it out, or if you do know sign language to communicate the word, or you can use technology such as using an iPad, a GoTalk, or a Mac button, which is the button that we could pre-record the words. For students who coming up with ideas might not be their strength right away, I would also provide options for them to choose from. So again, maybe they can just point, I would not eat green eggs and ham with a sneak or a spider. So again, they can tell me, they can sing it, they can point, they can draw it, or they can show us. Another repertoire example, uh, this is um, You've Got a Friend by Carol King. So in this example, we're talking more about social skills. How are we interacting with each other? In this context, while we were learning the song, we were learning how can we support each other? Sometimes things don't go right or we might be upset about something. So how can we learn to work together and support each other? So after we learned the song, we learned the lyrics, we had multiple different ways that we connected with it. We then took the chorus and we rewrote it. So here, just like you saw in Susa the Musical, in Green Eggs and Ham, we would just rewrite the words. So for example, I would call my friend, we would choose somebody in the class or somebody within our school community and talk about what are different ways that we would help support them if they were sad or they were down. And were you learning social skills while making music at the same time? So just to close out, we are all teachers of language. And we should think about using a whole language approach in all instances for all students. We as music teachers can incorporate strategies to help facilitate language use and communication in all aspects of what we're doing. And music and music making can be used as language for all students and all students will benefit from having these supports in their classrooms on a regular basis. I thank you for joining. And I hope that this was helpful for you. My contact information is there if you need it. Please feel free to email me or check out my website. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you.